Um, I hope many of you saw the announcement that after five years leading the Cockrell School of Engineering that Greg Finvis was promoted to serve as UT's Provost and Executive Vice President. But we are happy to have with us today Dr. Sharon L. Wood, who has been serving as Interim Dean of the Engineering School since October of 2013. Previously, Dean Wood served as Chair of UT's Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering for five years. She joined UT's faculty in 1996 after 10 years at the University of Illinois. She was recently inducted into the National Academy of Engineering for her research on the earthquake response of reinforced concrete structures. Of note, only one public engineering program, and that is Berkeley, has more professors in the National Academy of Engineering than Cockrell School. Dean Wood will share a few engineering updates and introduce the next faculty presentation on energy. Please welcome Dean Wood. Thank you very much, Becky. I am really pleased to be here today. There are more than 500 graduates of the Cockrell School who are working in uh, West Texas, living and working in West Texas. And um, we have more and more grads coming back to West Texas. Um, every time I talk to a student, it seems as if they've gotten a job in the oil and gas industry and they're coming to West Texas. I think right now about 30% uh, of our students are, are working in the energy industry. Um, right now, we also have about 50 students from West Texas who are students in the Cockrell School. Um, we have, um, as I mentioned, the oil and gas industry is facing a really big challenge. We're seeing a m large changes in the industry just because uh, the, the leaders are starting to retire. We need new people coming into the field, and we're taking our responsibility very seriously of training and educating the next generation of leaders for your industry. Um, this means that there's a, a constant need for new innovation, and not only will you need more engineers, scientists, geologists, but you're going to need the politicians and lawyers and um, business leaders who will come and really lead this field. And so that's where we, we take this cycle very seriously. We're looking at education, uh, workforce development, technology creation, and energy production. And we believe that all of those need to be t working together. They can't exist um, alone. That's one of the reasons why we're building a new building on campus. Uh, it's called the Engineering Education and Research Center. This will be the largest single building ever constructed on the UT campus. Uh, Welch Hall, which houses chemistry and <coughs> Memorial Stadium, where the football team plays, are actually larger structures, but they were built over many decades. And the um, Engineering Education Research Center will be one single building, um, and we will be starting, we're just starting to do the preliminary construction right now. Um, one of the things that makes this building so unique is that we are going to be emphasizing interdisciplinary educational experiences. So you heard Jamie talk about some of the novel things that are going on in liberal arts to try to give students new educational experiences. What we're going to be focusing on is trying to have um, project-based learning integrated throughout our curriculum. That means that students are going to start working on teams as freshmen, they're going to continue and work on these projects. Um, every year during the curriculum and we believe that really reinforces what they're learning in the classroom so they take the theory from the classroom they apply it to projects that have practical significance and they're going to be much more value to you when they graduate um, this facility which is costing about 310 million dollars so unlike randy we're not coming in under budget unfortunately <laughs> Um, this would not have been possible without the generosity of our friends and alumni. And many of you in this room have contributed to this building, and I want to thank you sincerely for that. Um, Senator uh, Seligan isn't, Seliger isn't here right now, but he also made incredible efforts to try to help us get tuition revenue bonds. Um, that, that did not go through in the last legislative session, but uh, it was really important to have the support of the legislature in this. The other thing about the um, Engineering Education and Research Center is that we do have funding from PUP, the Permanent University Fund. Um, this, are, this is the oil and gas land here in West Texas, and the royalties and lease payments are used to support not only the University of Texas at Austin, but the other schools in the UT system and the health, health centers, and also um, schools and uh, hospitals in the Texas A&M system. So we are all looking forward to the opening of the EERC. This will be in the fall of 2017, and our students will have state-of-the-art classrooms, and we're going to be tough tackling some of the toughest energy challenges that we face. 
Um, we are committed to continuing technology revolution, the renewed oil and gas development here in the U.S. And we believe UT is truly an energy university and what starts at UT does change the world. So what you will be hearing from are two of the faculty members who are the energy stars on our 40 acres. Um, they are leading new efforts related to this area and I'd like to introduce them. Uh, Dr. John Butler is the Associate Director of UT's Energy Management and Innovation Center in the McComb School. Um, in case you don't know, McComb School is one of the few schools in the country where almost every department is ranked um, in the top, among the top, and uh, it also is one of the largest schools. They have uh, 6,000 students each year, undergrads. Not quite what natural sciences has, but we can all be there. Um, <laughs> Dr. Butler is a driving force in the development of a new energy management program for undergrads, and he's passionate about engaging students in the real world uh, business experiences. And then Dr. Tad Patsick is chair of our top ranked Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. Uh, before joining UT, Tad served on the faculty at the University of California, Berkeley, and he also was a researcher at Shell Development. So he and his faculty are focusing on the development of the future workforce, um, technologies to tackle the complex shale and ultra deep water plays. Um, he has done in-depth analysis of the condo blowout and he has, he's currently serving on a 15-member offshore drilling safety committee for the Department of the Interior. So we're gonna do a little bit different um, format for the, the last phase of this UT in a day. We're gonna run a panel discussion. I'll start off by asking uh, John and Tad a few questions to get them going, talking, telling you about what's new related to energy education here at, at UT, and then we'll open it up to questions from you. So if Tad and John will come forward, please. So I'm going to start off just by asking each of you how your school is preparing the students to be successful leaders in the energy industry. Well, uh, first of all, uh, before I start, uh, I would like to say that I'm glad to be back in Midland. Uh, I've been coming here for the last six years. In uh, fact, several faces in the audience look almost as familiar as my family. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm so very glad to see so many friends here. Um, Midland is a very dynamic city. Well, I don't need to remind you, it's one of the biggest gold cities around the US. Uh, and I think by its, through its dynamism, it's very successfully competing with the likes of Houston and Dallas. Um, well, so it, it, <laughs> I, I don't like give too, too long a speech, but I have to reflect on, on the previous presentations. Uh, in fact, on the historical presentation uh, by Professor Suri, um, it, who said that uh, America is all about democracy, economics, and power. And I would like to reflect on that from the point of view of power, of different kinds of power. You know, we all talk about energy. What we really mean is energy per unit time, which is power. If we just talked about energy, we would be using small batteries to, to drive our cars not V8s, okay. So the current civilization that we have developed so successfully uh, from the mid 19th century till today and for some decades to come is based on power. And that power since the 1860s, uh, especially after 1901, has been delivered by hydrocarbons. So you can call us a hydrocarbon civilization. Okay? And, 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 and I'm not trying to understate the importance of hydrocarbons. It started from coal, but coal was soon uh, was overtaken by the power coming from the hydrocarbons. When it comes to democracy, uh, there are two important things to notice. First of all, there can be no democracy without fertile soil and big, big ecosystems that deliver all the natural goods, clean water and clean air. So that is the number one necessary condition uh, for democracy. And if you want to think about democracies that went down, think about the Middle East. Um, but it is also impossible without power. In fact, one can argue by looking at civilizations from times or since times immemorial that all of them developed to a level which was limited. 
by two things, by the power available per capita or per unit area, as in older times power came from the sun, so the more area you had, the more power you became, because you were harvesting the solar power collected by other civilizations in terms of their gold and artifacts and people, and then you build your power. That was the story of the Roman Empire. Um, today it's a little bit different. We are using power that was collected by the sun over hundreds of millions of years, and in some cases billions of years. So that makes our civilization very different. The more power flows to the society, the more complex the society can become, because it has more excess energy or power to do things like liberal arts, uh, like history, like psychology, and many other things. Without that power, these things would be uh, almost non-existent. Okay? Um, so, now, so from that broad perspective, let me just focus back on a very practical uh, department of petroleum engineering. Um, so we are in the midst of the struggle to develop new sources of power. Right? So, and one of these new sources of power are unconventionals with which you and we are struggling uh, with varying degree of success. Um, however, as you know, these unconventionals are uh, what made the boom around the Midland area, but also in Ecuador possible and these boons interfere now with astronomy, and that will get to used to me. Uh, so I guess less flaring and fewer uh, uh, well-had uh, you know, lines. Uh, so I guess that can be resolved. Um, we are, in many ways, a very practical department. We rely mostly on industrial support to carry out our research, which we feel is very important for the industry and for the nation. And our students are also, uh, especially at the undergraduate level, very practical people. They want to finish their studies at four years. In fact, many of them do, probably more than in many other departments. And the reason is not because, uh, you know, uh, well, there are many reasons, but one is that 100 plus K uh, once they <laughs> leave the university, that's a great motivational gradient <laughs> um, uh, here. Um, we try to prepare the students, just as Dean Wood said, uh, for their new roles in the industry. Industry is a state of flux. Many, you all want to hire somebody with five years of experience, that's the magic number, right? Um, how many of you have been hiring students fresh out of school? Can I see a, can I see a, a, a a forest of hands. <laughs> okay, there is one. And so we're kind of anticipating this. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to give our students not only the basics in terms of broad uh, education and deep education, and that cannot be, by the way, achieved through a MOOC. Um, and, but we also want to give them practical knowledge through internships and through projects with the faculty that prepare them to take this enormous responsibility that the various young people take. And you know, if, if I talk to, to Richard and Lois, uh, by the way, I, I have a chair with their name, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, uh, their uh, son-in-law works for Anadarko in the offshore environment, and it's what, what how many years out? Uh, out, of, out of the university? Two years. And he has already an enormous, almost crushing responsibility for very dangerous offshore <coughs> uh, facilities. And so you can see that it behooves us to be very harsh graders, which we are, uh, and also very demanding on our students, which we are, and so that the, the bright, the driven people who leave our department are the best they can be. <coughs> and because of it, we have absolutely no problems with finding jobs for our students. As you know, times are varying in our industry. Uh, we're still doing very well, thank you very much. And I would encourage you to risk the unspeakable and hire that fresh out of school <laughs> person because you might get surprised <laughs> how well they work. Thank you.
Thanks, Ted. Um, this is my third time to be in Midland. It's, it's good to be back. I've seen some of you before uh, talking about this program, specifically that was mentioned earlier, the EMP. And it is interesting how all these things that you've heard today were linked. And so I started my PhD at the University of Texas in 1991, at which point there were about 10,000 people in the business school. So one in five people you'd see on campus was part of the business school, and that was viewed as almost untenable. It was just not going uh, to continue to exist in that size. So we made a deal with the university to offer effectively a minor in business. And so one of the ways that we try to contribute to these future leaders is by allowing folks that are petroleum engineers or geography students or econ students, well, they get plenty of business over in economics, but some more exposure to basic business through something called business foundations. The new program that we started is almost the opposite of that. It is trying to get some of this technical information, at least an appreciation for it, into the hands of students who are not gonna be digging holes or building giant telescopes, folks that are gonna help run these organizations. And so we're very excited about it. Um, there's a gentleman in Dallas named Bill Phillips, who's a, one of the head layman for Hunt. And in about 2000, he started coming to the University of Texas probably three times a year, knocking on different doors, trying to inquire what had happened to the old PLM degree. This was the, the story that had been, to, has been told to you several times. There were different paths that were started. Some of you are more aware of this than others, but I'll just say that what we ended up with was deciding, let's just put more energy in the curriculum, and we'll sort the rest of it out later. I mean, how can that be a bad thing for the University of Texas to have more energy in its curriculum and not less? And the conversations ended up in a very good place, but one started where I went to Ted, and I said, okay, I'm gonna, I would like you to help me create a class that we would call something like petroleum operations, or I think we've ended up calling it as non-technical exploration and production. And he said, that sounds like a wonderful class. In fact, some of the engineers would like to take it. You might have heard we're full, right? And so I knocked on the door of the Jackson School, the same thing, like we're full. We don't have anybody to teach sedimentary rock to this set of students that you're interested in. So I jokingly said to Tad, well, why don't I hire him over the summer? And he nodded and said, that'd be fine. And so what ended up happening was we were forced into this predicament where the only way to get access to this talent we have on campus, because you don't want me teaching these classes, let me just put it that way, right? I, I heard the cats, I'm not gonna teach the classes, so I speak UT in this thing. To get these folks, we had over, offer these courses over the summer. And so what's ended up happening is we've almost created like an energy summer camp. So the students can get 12 hours of credit in nine weeks, but it's like having a job, right? They're gonna take four classes in that period, in two three-hour chunks with two hours off for lunch four days a week. What that allows us to do is we effectively have a captive audience. So we bring in the Railroad Commission at lunch. We bring in a lot of outside speakers <coughs> to come and talk to them to represent sort of what is it like to do business in the energy business. The other thing that's great is we have them on Fridays. A lot of them want to go home, but a lot of them don't every Friday. And so we take them to run title in Giddings. We go to the Lee County Courthouse and they all run title. We took them to a well site in Quera. The HP Billiton was nice enough to sponsor that. We'll take them to Galveston this year to see the operating rig um, in Galveston that they can get their hands on. We're just trying to give them some exposure, right? A lot of what um, I hear when I talk to people in the energy business is even if you're not in it, it would be nice if people at least kind of understood, right? It, 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 the fact that somebody put it to me that the number of hands it takes to touch a barrel of oil, to turn it into gasoline for your car, and yet it costs less than a gallon of milk, is you know, almost staggering to think about. And just having people understand that would be valuable. And that's really what this program does. And so one of our biggest supporters is Jim Devlin in Corpus, and he is a landman by training. And what he always says is, sure, we're gonna train some landmen, but we're also gonna train some oil men. But this is about training people for the industry and giving this kind of exposure. And I, I went longer than I meant to, I apologize, but the other thing to remember is this is the minimum we want these students to do. If they'll come and work with us for that summer, and we're targeting their sophomore summer, so the engineers will have to do their freshman summer probably, but this is the minimum they need to do, right? And once they get sort of pledged into the fraternity, we'll give them more and more opportunities and point them in the direction of these other folks around campus because we're a very good business school that happens to be situated in you know, one of the world's best technical institutions that there is. And so we're trying to leverage that information in, the, in those folks. So that's what we're trying to do. So you talked about delivering or this collaboration across campus. Can you talk a little bit more about how it can go beyond this first initial um, program? Well, uh, <clears throat> petroleum engineering is an essentially interdisciplinary uh, area of study in engineering and science and geology, and material science and geophysics 
and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and computer engineering and physics and chemistry and so on, right? So you need to know a little bit of each or then a lot of each to be good in drilling, in completions, uh, in hand soil recovery, in trying to image your reservoir, find your reservoir, and increase your ultimate recovery, right? Fracture your reservoir. That's a very complex area of study and, and of understanding. So we, by our very nature of our profession, have always tried to establish connections with other department schools. Uh, and in fact, uh, we do it at two levels, and I think in the morning, um, I don't recall who mentioned, yes, I think it was you mentioned that research and teaching are parts of each other, right? They're two sides of the same coin. You cannot separate them. You cannot have these super bright teachers unless they also are allowed to do research, and, and vice versa. If they don't do research, uh, you don't have the stellar university. Okay. So, so we started doing these very deep collaborations by working with geology and geophysics and Bureau of Economic Geology on several very large projects, uh, multi-year projects sponsored by Shell and by Stadoil. Uh, we have now brought some of our friends uh, in, in the College of Engineering, in Computer Science, Mechanical Engineering, uh, Civil Engineering, other departments, on a set of projects which are sponsored by DP. And in fact, the fastest growing part of our department, which is the drilling program, uh, headed by uh, our new hire, Professor Van Ort, uh, relies in an absolutely essential way. Uh, I mean, he cannot do what he wants to do. Yes, uh, on, uh, it's always my, my bad, bad luck, uh, five. Um, and, uh, without participation of mechanical engineers, computer scientists, uh, uh, people who know a lot about sensors, uh, material scientists, etc. I'll stop at that. <laughs> and I no, would, business. Business, business, yes. I was say, <laughs> forgot. And, well, and, and it, it's funny. So we were talking about counting galaxies earlier. So one of the things that happens at UT, there's a group called the Energy Institute, which is designed to sort of span the entire campus as you know, this big umbrella organization. And when they came on campus, they decided to figure out, well, how many energy centers are there? Depending on how you define it, there's 23, right? And they're all over the place, right? And they're scattered around. And so the idea is we should work more together and not less. And what's good is I've got them attended at some of these meetings and is we sort of trust each other, because that's a lot of what this is. We've got silos like organizations like everybody else. As we're exposed to each other at the faculty level, it opens doors to the students. So it really does a lot of times start at these collaborative meetings. We worked on the REEF project together, which was a, a, a idea we were trying to get a large government grant to study safety in offshore and other extreme environments like the Arctic. Right? So I know a lot of the engineering faculty, there's CPAR, the Center for Petroleum Asset Risk Management. I study decision making, really. It's just that there's a lot of interesting uncertainty and decisions to be made in energy, so it's a natural application. And so there's all these ways we get involved in the students are the ones who ultimately benefit. Um, an exciting thing that we're also we're doing, the law school's been a big leader in this, is offering interdisciplinary courses where we will pull in four to five students from engineering, business, law, policy, and the Jackson School to solve one problem. Because what we hear from industry is that's what they're going to do. They're going to be on a team. They don't just have to learn to think like a petroleum engineer. They need to think like a petroleum engineer who's got an environmental communication person that needs to be satisfied about what's in these fracking fluids as an example. And so putting him in these classes has been really sort of exciting, but the reason that happens is because the faculty interact. And so it was really important to emphasize at that faculty level what we could do. So how can UT best inform and impact energy policy? Um, that's a question that is best left to political scientists. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I have to be very careful here. So our strength is in our science and in the technology that we develop. I see you, yes, in this two minutes. Um, and so as long as we speak the truth to science and technology, and as long as our students are truly of remarkably high level, we have done our job. Having said that, we also need to interact more with the public, the media, and that's fraught with risks a part of which is the different vocabularies 
that we engineers and, and the rest of the public use. So there's quite often common misunderstanding, and because of this misunderstanding, there's mutual suspicion. And I always tell everybody to relax a little bit about these things, uh, because the more we talk with the public, we are actually essentially better off, even though sometimes we don't do such a good job of it, right? So I'll stop at that. I would agree. We should provide the science that helps inform policy as a university. That's what we should do. And there, we do have individual faculty that I would call advocates, but as a university, that's not our job. Right? We're out there to generate the core science that then you know, starts, uh, starts impacting policy. The, the other interesting thing that we do as part of McCombs, uh, well, I got two minutes. You both got two minutes? All right, fine. Uh, you might have seen Wednesday, there was a release of the UT Energy Poll. And so it is a poll that we conduct every six months um, is part of an initiative to sort of try to measure public perception around energy. Uh, and it's frustrating for people that know a lot about it because they think we should offer the UT Energy test, right? We should test people on what they know. It is a poll. And what we have to remember is no matter how much you know, you still get to vote. And so that's what we're trying to figure out is where are the holes that we, as the sort of holders of facts, can try to influence people, right? So we, in this last round of the poll, 53% of the public favored the export of natural gas. And Tad and I were talking about this last night at dinner. Do they really even understand all the issues and the nuances? And are they thinking that we're talking about gas for their car? I'm still convinced a lot of people aren't sure. <laughs> are they natural gas and gasoline? But, but the point is we're going to try to measure that, and then we're going to try to fill, as a university, those misperceptions. And that's one thing that we can do. So there's lots of opportunities to do those kind of things. So we'd like to open up to the audience for questions. Yes, please. There was an article published a few months ago in Journal of Petroleum Technology that talked about the um, commonality between the number of petroleum engineering graduates in the 80s and the current trend in undergraduate programs. Um, could you speak to what you're feeling about that or what you're seeing and your recommendation to kids who are considering petroleum engineering? Right, so the question was that there is a um, striking resemblance between the level of student population in the early 1980s, is this what you were, and today. In fact, uh, the, the total student population in all petroleum engineering programs today is somewhat higher than it was in 1983 when it crashed together with the price of oil. Um, so I can only speak for UT. I will not speak for other institutions because I would be subjecting them to undue criticism. Um, so at UT, we tried to, to not to run away with the enrollment, uh, despite you know really inconveniencing many people and admitting them quite a lot. You know we have a, quite a few angry parents, and that's for two reasons. We have a facility of a certain size and a faculty of a certain size. We have exceeded all student to faculty ratio, ratios that are reasonable for an engineering program already. We don't want to add more to that without the new building and more faculty. And that's because our number one priority is to have the highest possible quality of our product. So that whoever hires a student from UT, uh, being, you know, be it Chris Rasmussen here from Midland, and he's got, he already got hired, um, or, or many other students have this warm, fuzzy feeling, yeah, we're going to trust that program and this guy. Um, I, I think I'll stop at that. Other programs ran away with doubling and tripling their enrollment while not increasing the size of faculty, which results in a lower, uh, less <coughs> deep education for the students. And unfortunately, in engineering, there is no MOOC substitute for one-on-one -on -one interaction and individual study and so I would say we've done the right thing here we will increase our uh, enrollment should there be a need for that right we are in the cyclic industry when we get a bigger facility and more faculty thank you I would say do it uh, <laughs> no, it's, I mean I, I started off in engineering at another school in the Southwest Conference uh, and then eventually ended up getting my PhD at the right one. But I started off in engineering, but that was not my cup of tea. Because my parents said, we gave you an erector set for Christmas and you didn't play with it very long. Why did you think you were going to be an engineer? And I 
just takes a certain personality type to do it, but I just can't imagine that under any circumstances having that training would not prepare you for life, no matter what happens to the, to the cost of oil. So if you can get in at UT, just do it. I mean, that would, I think would be my advice. Do it if you can. Right. <laughs> Another question. Yes. Dr. Patrick, how are, how are you coming on getting uh, American students to pursue uh, masters in petroleum engineering or PhDs? And secondly, how is the succession planning for your own faculty coming along? Recall Dr. Lake and Dr. Pope, who educated Lois and I, are still around and uh, they can't be around forever even though we love them. Um, hmm, Steve. Um, okay. <laughs> um, well, so, uh, so, so, so the second part is how are we, uh, the easy part, how are we, what are we doing about replenishing the faculty? And the first part, the difficult part, was <laughs> what are we doing about Americans or permanent residents uh, being the master students and the PhDs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll start from the hard part. Um, what we're doing is we have uh, um, uh, formed and got funded by the Yates family, uh, mostly uh, um, a, a summer program where we bring uh, juniors and seniors from other universities and other fields of engineering and science to our department and we expose them to our ways, corrupt their young souls, <laughs> and then make them into petroleum engineers. And the idea here is that uh, these young people want to then uh, go on and do graduate studies. And many of them do, and many of them actually enroll in our department. <coughs> these and other you know, actions have resulted in a great increase of master's level students who are American. You know, 40, 50 percent now are American. At the PhD level, we're not as successful. If we get 20 percent of Americans at the PhD level, we're lucky. The reason is that uh, the young people, whether at bachelor's degree level or master's degree level, are exposed to all kinds of temptations. One of them would be this super high salary <coughs> and very generous packages offered by the deaf different companies. So very often students who start at the master's level wanting to finish a PhD then are lured by our industrial friends to a better life elsewhere. Um, so, so, so that's where we are. In terms of um, transition, it's easier said than done. Uh, you do not replace somebody like Larry Lake or Gary Pope, uh, just like this, right? doesn't happen. What you need to do is you probably need to hire a young person and then groom that person for several years. So that's the strategy that we are pursuing. Um, we will, as far as we know, uh, have more positions and strategically uh, at least two of these positions will be in the area of engineering and we have to then groom the young people. This is actually very difficult to find the right people, and it's a, it's a very tortuous process. So that's what we have. Any other questions? Thank you, Sharon and Ted and John, so much. And thank all of you all for coming to this inaugural UT in a day event. We thank you so much for participating. Josh tells me that you will be receiving an email that we ask that you evaluate our program today so that we'll have ideas of how we can do a better job with the next one here in Midland and with uh, subsequent UT in a day in other communities. So please do that. Also, if you didn't on your way in get this beautiful burnt orange UT in a day book and your orange pen, please get one on the way out. It looks to me like we can only write important things in this book because it's so nice. So if you think of something important, let me know so I'll have something to write in my book as well. Uh, I'm so proud of all the outstanding faculty who came to join us today and the deans. Uh, we are so lucky here in Midland to have such a great relationship with the University of Texas. And I really appreciate you all. So much. With that, uh, thank you for coming, and uh, we hope we see you again the next time we do this.